Uh, well, welcome everyone to another week of the MSR AI seminar. It's great to have you here. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Zewan Alan Zhu, uh, who's a senior researcher at MSR in the Machine Learning and Optimization Group. Uh, he's been with us for a few years. Um, and Zewan has done some really, really interesting work on kind of unraveling the mysteries of deep learning. And I think today he's going to share with us some of those mysteries some of the things he's learned, uh, and basically just answer all of your questions that you've, you've had about deep learning. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Zewan. Thank you so much, Sean. So uh, maybe I can't answer all of them, but I would try to address uh, as many as I can. Uh, so, okay, why does deep learning perform deep learning? So uh, before I even start to address this question, let me ask you something even more stupid. Uh, what is deep learning? So if you go to Wikipedia, it says deep learning uh, is also known as hierarchical learning or hierarchical feature learning. So this citation here uh, actually goes to uh, the 2014 book uh, written by Li Deng and Dong Yu, who used to be here at MSR. Actually, Li Deng created the deep learning research team here, but now they are directors uh, at other places like Citadel and Tencent. So they wrote on their first line of their book that deep learning is hierarchical feature learning, and by this, they actually mean that the features from higher levels are learned as simple functions over features of lower levels. Okay, so you know, in, your, in your network, for instance, we may have like convolutional layer, layers, which are simple functions, but once you learn like simple functions over simple over simple, the combined thing can be a very complex concept that you're learning. So therefore, like back to the early days, like say 2014, uh, this is like a common law, common knowledge. People understand that deep learning is doing hierarchical feature learning. But because recent years, uh, in recent years, deep learning has evolved so fast, especially on the applied side, people have really started to forget about this. Uh, over the past weekend, like I tried to, for instance, survey two of my friends. So I asked the first one, like, what is deep learning? And he told me deep learning is AI. The second friend, like, uh, she told me deep learning is like, lost that backward. So of course they're both correct. I mean, in the sense that, uh, you know, this is how you implement deep learning, but still like intrinsically, what is deep learning? What is it learning? So not only my friends, in fact, even on Wikipedia, uh, this word of like hierarchical learning has been dropped since uh, January 2020, actually. Uh, this is down by a like Canadian IP address. So this person said, Deep learning is not known as hierarchical learning, and none of the citations below call it like this. Okay, what the hell? So I just showed you a citation, okay? And you can also Google, and uh, like not only like Yosho Banjo says that, also like Ian Goodfellow and Aaron Coville, they also said that. So for instance, uh, Ian and Aaron wrote in their like very recent book by saying that the hierarchy of concepts allows the computer to learn complicated concepts by building them out of simpler ones. So therefore, deep learning is hierarchical feature learning. But wait a sec, if so, then what are the features? Okay, in particular, if you have, say, a convolutional neural network that tells you a cat is a cat, then what did you actually learn in those intermediate layers? So before I even start to address this, uh, some of you may ask, like, why do I care? Like, if it can like predict cats correctly, like almost 100% time, then why do I care about the intermediate layers? So imagine that maybe tomorrow you'll go to see a doctor and the doctor tells you, oh, uh, just take those pills. You ask why, uh, the doctor say, I don't know, deep patient tells you so. So this is in fact not a joke. So in fact, this is said by the leader of the deep patient team at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. So they said, we have like very good models, but we don't know why they work. So therefore, like sometimes it's really desirable to understand what the method is actually doing, like layer by layer, as opposed to just applying it as a black box method. So we really want to know what the features are. So some of you may think that well, we already know what the features are. Like if you look at, say, uh, Yen Lacun's lecture notes, he said, oh, the lower level of features, for instance, the first layer is going to learn some simple features like the edge features, namely like the stripes and some color features and so on. Then the middle layers will learn something more complicated, maybe something like 
uh, that is more curly, and the higher level features will be even more complicated, like a dog face and so on. So if you buy this, that is, this is what neural networks will learn. Then let me ask the next question, like, why can neural networks learn such features? Okay, you may think, well, because I build the architecture this way, right? I build it as a simple function over a simple function over a simple function, and it should be all to learn something that's simple, the more complicated, more complicated. But in fact, there is a very serious, like, philosophical question here. That is, if I build the architecture this way, does it really mean that the neural network or deep learning procedure will actually find the architecture this way? So I'm going to give you at least uh, two counterexamples. The first one is more like a math counterexample. The second one is more like uh, uh, like more practical counterexample. Okay. So the first one uh, is with respect to fully connected feed-forward neural network. So suppose we have maybe say eight layers of some fully connected network, and the input is say some d-dimensional vector. And suppose, for simplicity, that we have only quadratic activations, so not ReLU, but quadratic. So in this way, we know that the first layer is going to learn something that's quadratic over the input, the second layer is going to learn something that's degree four over the input and degree eight over the input. So naturally, like, the features become more and more complex, as you can see by the degree as you go on. So if I build the architecture this way, does it mean I can learn functions that are of the form that is a quadratic over quadratic over quadratic. Does it mean that? So I claim that no, because in this way, just with eight layers, it suffices for you to implement uh, any parity function over dimension 128. So parity function is a function that basically multiplies some of the uh, input coordinates together. So it's easy to show that for every set S, OK, there exists a way for you to implement maybe some eight layers of quadratic functions so that you can output this parity function. But on the other hand, learning parity, function, learning parity functions with noise is known to be pretty hard. So it usually requires like uh, at least sub-exponentially many samples or running time. Even there exist crypto applications that are built on those like uh, noisy parity function uh, on the hardness of learning noisy parity functions. And therefore, like, we do not expect almost any method to be able to learn this class of functions uh, in polynomial time or polynomially number of samples, not to say neural networks. So therefore, like, it's not true that you build the network as quadratic over quadratic over quadratic. Then you will always learn quadratic over quadratic over quadratic. So this is the first counterexample. Okay, I build the architecture this way, but deep learning may not necessarily find it. The second kind of example I will give you uh, is more like an applied example. So everyone knows ResNet. It has the identity link and so on. So ResNet is great for many reasons, like resolving vanishing gradient and so on. Uh, but uh, because it's so popular that people started to form their own opinion about why ResNet is good. So for instance, a very common saying you can find on Stack Exchange is that the idea of ResNet is that each layer should not learn the whole feature at once, but only a residual correction of the previous layer. Right? I have the identity link. For instance, here I have the identity link, and then the last layer, the row of the last uh, actually block, there are two layers here, is to learn something that's a residual correction to the, everything before that. So this may seem reasonable because I build the architecture this way, but I claim it's not what's really happening in practice. So here's the experiment. Suppose I first remove the last block. I keep the identity link, but I remove the two convolutional layers. Now, if I do, uh, say, CIFAR 10 training on the CIFAR 10 data set, and suppose I do even you know, a very hard task of the so-called robust adversarial training with respect to some error infinity norm. So if you don't know what this is, it's OK. So it's just some hard task. I'm going to cover that in the second half of the talk. So it, it's some task, and if you only train the, uh, those layers by ignoring the last one, so this is the robust accuracy you're going to get. It's like, say, 53.9. So next, let's add back the last block. 
And suppose we freeze all of the previous layers and only train the last block. Your accuracy can be improved, you know, incrementally, but only by a little bit. But instead, if you train everything together, you're going to see a much bigger accuracy jump. So for those of you who work in this area, you can realize that uh, this is already a big accuracy jump. So this is actually a common knowledge in applied deep learning. That is, you should never train things like layer-wise. You should not train things like layerly and then freeze the previous layers and only train the next layer. You should actually train all of them at once. But if so, then it's essentially saying that this way of thinking may be wrong because Freezing the previous layers and only training the last layer is precisely learning this residual correction. But in fact, deep learning is doing something else that is more than this residual correction, so that it gives you some even better accuracy. Okay. So, therefore, this is the second example that shows yes, I build the architecture this way uh, as like seemingly to do a residual correction, but deep learning may actually in the end do something else. In this case, even better. So I hope these two examples together can illustrate some difficulties of, uh, about, like, uh, uh, regarding like what the features really are, like through learning and how the features really uh, evolve during the training. So I want to uh, want you to keep this question in mind, and let me also mention a second question that remains largely unsolved in deep learning theory. That is why. Is deep learning better than non-hierarchical learning or shallow learning? So for those of you who attended my talk last time, uh, you may uh, like immediately recognize this picture. Namely, like we know very well how convex optimization works, uh, kernel methods and so on in theory and in matches practice. But for neural networks, it, it works very well in practice, but our theory is very largely like lagging behind. So in past a few years, people have really done some amazing work, but so far, like, our knowledge is the following. That is, neural networks can simulate some very good kernel method, the so-called neurotangent kernel. So no matter, so yes, it does have the word neural in it. No matter how many word neural you put in it, in the end of the day, it is still like a single layer learning method. It's still like a kernel method. You're only learning one layer of ways with respect to some prescribed features defined by the kernel. So you are not actually learning the features. So therefore, like, kernel method is like shallow learning. So what is really desirable here is to maybe discover some function classes that can be learned efficiently by multi-layer neural networks and cannot be efficiently learned by any kernel method or any shallow learning method. So this is not known, and this is like the hope of doing like the real deep learning theory. So don't get me wrong, there definitely exist great works that separates, for instance, for instance, like three layer networks from two layer networks. So uh, that is saying that you have, uh, there exists like polysized three layer networks that cannot be represented by uh, poly, uh, polysized two layer networks. But uh, this is only regarding the capacities. So it means there exist such networks that are better, but it doesn't necessarily mean that deep learning can actually find it. So therefore, like, it's very desirable to get this kind of separation in the efficient computable regime. That is why I emphasize on the word efficient. Like, can we, in polynomial time, learn something, but in polynomial time, you cannot learn with shallow learning methods. So this is the second question I want to uh, address today. So before I move on to that, let me even define what do I mean by shallow learners? What do I mean by non-hierarchical learning? So, Hierarchical learning, as I said, is deep learning. Non-hierarchical learning, I don't have a precise definition to that. All I can say is that uh, is to give you examples, like linear models, like kernel methods, uh, with, respect, uh, with respect to arbitrary kernels, uh, and the linear models over, say, finitely many uh, future mappings, and you can add arbitrary convex generalizations. So those are like one-layer learnings. So you're only learning one layer of the features. So you can also do, say, uh, some uh, one-layer learning, but after unsupervised learning. You can first do some randomized, uh, random features and so on, and then do, say, linear regression. So those, I think everyone agrees, are shallow learning, right? Because you're essentially only training one layer of weights. But there are also other methods that some people say is hierarchical learning, some people say it's not. 
So today, to be safe, let me call them weak hierarchical learning methods. So this includes especially layer-wise training of a neural network. So on one hand, layer-wise training is hierarchical because you're learning one layer, then another layer on top of the layer, another simple function on top of the previous one, and so on. But if you think about it, this is essentially performing a sequential steps of single layer over single layer over single layer. And we know that in practice, you need to train everything together. And this will, be, uh, this will perform better, not only than the single layer method, but also it will perform better than those like single layer over single layer over single layer. And uh, therefore, like this question number two I want to address here is asking this question that is, why is it better here comparing to everything below? So those are the two central questions I wish to address today. Uh, before I move on, let me emphasize once again that it's not necessarily true that if you build something deep, then in the end of the day, you will learn something deep. Maybe you will learn something shallow, right? So therefore, like, it's very important to understand like, what are the features, how do they involve, and uh, what are they, like, in the end of the training, like, what they really are, is that really deep? So the first result I want to show you today uh, is a joint work with uh, Yuan Zhili, CMU professor. So in our result, we have proof by picture and proof by simple math. So let me begin with the proof by picture. That is, suppose we take, say, AlexNet. Most people know AlexNet, five-layer neural networks, and suppose we do, uh, say, 10-class classification on CIFAR-10 data set, and let us focus on the features of the first layer, which is easier to write down. This is just 11 by 11 by 3, so it's an 11 by 11 RGB picture, so you can just plot it and see, like, how does it evolve during training. So as a simple experiment, let me first remove the rest of the convolutional layers and, and only connect the output of the first convolutional layer to directly to the, to the, essentially to the output. And then suppose we only train the first layer. Let's see what happens. Okay? So starting from random initialization, I claim that the 64 neurons will very quickly converge, and then no matter how you change like learning rate, how you like change weight decay, uh, they pretty much stay where they are, they don't change anymore. This is fully optimized if you only train the first layer. But if you suddenly add other layers also into the training, then the features start to improve again very, very fast. And eventually they just become something that you can tell like it's much better than if you train the first layer only. And for such reason, we refer to uh, training only the current layer or the previous layers as the process of forward feature learning. And we refer to uh, the second step as backward feature correction. Namely, you're training deeper layers, which somehow helps the, sh the lower levels to actually improve. Okay, so this is a toy example regarding the first layer of AlexNet. But let's see some more complicated example. So for instance, ResNet, okay. So for ResNet, we can do the experiment about say, removing the last block and then adding it back and let us see how the features evolve. Remember like the features have to evolve because if they don't, then this becomes layer-wise training. Uh, if the features of the previous layer like don't change anymore, uh, then like we don't get good accuracy because we are doing, we are only training the last layer. So in this experiment, let me first remove the, uh, remove this block and train only the previous layers and visualize all the features. And then let me add this back and see how the features change. Okay, so uh, I understand that people have different ways of visualizing features. I'm going to actually cover the visualization, uh, feature visualization algorithms in the second half of the talk. But suppose for now you buy that this is some feature visualization algorithm. You see like horses and uh, trucks and so on. Then let's not worry about the algorithm and see like how it evolves under this visualization algorithm. If you add this last block in, I claim that this is what's going to happen. So two observations. First, features get improved. Maybe it's hard to see from the pictures, but I promise you that the accuracy got improved. And more importantly, like the features correlate with what have already existed if you only train the previous layers. For instance, like 
this was a uh, truck, it, it remains to be a truck. This was a dog, it remains to a dog. So the features don't change drastically. By adding the, a new block in, then the features don't change drastically. They only get backward corrected a tiny bit. Okay, so this is something you can experimentally verify and is what we refer to as backward feature correction. So to sum up, from the pictures, we see that lower level features are not very good if we only train them. They can be improved if we train higher level features altogether. And this actually explains why like layer-wise training cannot match the performance of training all the layers together. So this we all know in practice. You can do VGG, you can do ResNet. And for instance, if you use a wide ResNet, pretty much if you do layer-wise training, uh, once you're into the third block, the accuracy doesn't increase anymore. So you really need to train everything together in order for you to get the additional accuracy for going deeper and deeper. So those are actually something people already very well understood in practice. So the central question I want to address today is like, why? Why suddenly, like, even if I fully optimized the previous layers, like the features are already good, but then how come like when I start to also optimize the later layers, then the features of the previous one get improved? If so, then why don't they already learn these good features uh, at the first place? So those are the questions I want to address. So in order to address that, I need to go into a little bit of simple math. So from a very high level, I want to prove, uh, I, want to, I want to first focus on a specific class of architectures so that I can state theorems, right? So the architecture I'm going to talk about today uh, is L layer dense net. So basically I have L layers and also the layers can have some interconnections. So in the original notion of dense net, then ev essentially every pair of layers have connections. But in our paper, we only need to assume that each layer has at least one link from the previous layer and at least one skip link from one of the previous layers uh, except the second layer that doesn't need. So we have a minor requirement which supports uh, a large class of uh, architectures in this like set of, and we, we call all of them like L layer dense net. And we uh, also assume that the output is some linear combination of all the previous layers. So we focus on this type of architectures. Now, uh, what is our goal? Uh, so first of all, let me even simplify by saying that the inputs are like 1D, it's a D-dimensional thing, and the output is a single real number. So it's not pictures, those are vectors that makes the theorems easier to be stated. So our goal here is to show that maybe for any target network that you can write like this, by doing like deep learning, by doing like stochastic gradient descent, you can find maybe a network that is a bit wider, say so quadratically wider, that can learn this target network to an arbitrary accuracy. In other words, our grand dream is to prove a result like for any network of this form, we can learn it as long as we have a bit of over parameterization. Okay, so some of you may already notice that this grand goal is not achievable because a few slides ago, I just told you that it's not what I build, then it's going to be what you learn. Because for instance, with L layers, I can implement say a parity function, but there's no hope of learning that efficiently. So that means I need to make assumptions. So the first assumption I want to make uh, for the first half of the talk is that we have quadratic activations. So not real loop, quadratic. So I know that quadratics is a bit weaker than ReLU, but it still gives very decent accuracy, for instance, on, even on CIFAR 100. So this accuracy is much, much better than kernel methods, uh, not to say that it's 100 times faster than kernel methods and so on. So in contrast, if you do ReLU, like you get maybe say 81% accuracy, but here you get like almost 78. So this means that like in the first half of the talk, I am not going to be, so to put it another way, so yes, I'm using quadratic activations, that's weaker than ReLU, but I claim I am not secretly doing some shallow learning. So I'm still doing something that is very non-trivial, that is deep learning, because even if I have something easy that's quadratic, but having L layers, then the network can be of degree two to the L. So it can still be very complex, okay? So therefore, like, let me just not go into details. Suppose we're happy to make assumption like it's quadratic, 
And also, the next assumption I want to make is inputs are sufficiently random, and we support like mixture of Gaussians and so on, but say uh, it's just standard Gaussian for now. Then, most importantly, I need to make assumptions on target network because not all networks of this form can be efficiently learnable, so I need to make assumptions. The first one I want to make is that the weight matrices are well conditioned. So let me denote by G4 the output of the fourth layer and G3 the third layer and so on. Then in the I will only be able to learn those networks whose computational paths are having those like uh, each com computational path involving some uh, weight matrices, right? So maybe this is the weight from the previous layer to the current layer, from the second layer to the current layer. But I am only going to learn those functions whose weight matrices are well conditioned, meaning that they don't degenerate, meaning that their singular values are, say, between 1 and 100. So one immediate consequence of this is that at least the output of the network is 2 to the L. Uh, sorry, the output of the network is of degree 2 to the L so that we don't have cancellation, so things don't degenerate. So that is a kind of typical assumption that people make when proving theoretical theorems, so we're happy. But the last assumption I want to make is actually a very important one. We're really popularizing it nowadays, and it's very related to hierarchical learning, is this what we call information gap assumption. So remember the output of the target network we're learning is a linear average, a linear summation over all the layers. Uh, actually, there's no this link. Uh, there's no link to the input, but only those links exist. So the output is a weighted uh, summation of the previous layers, but we assume that the weight actually goes down as you go deeper and deeper. So if you don't like math, then just keep in mind the following example. The target network is some degree two polynomial plus some small quantity like say 0.3 times a degree 4 polynomial plus maybe say 0.09 times a degree 8 polynomial and so on. So we assume that the target network is not an arbitrary like degree 2 to the L polynomial, but instead it has a big component that's easy, degree 2, a slightly smaller component that's a bit harder, and some even smaller component that is even harder and so on. So the reason we make this assumption is first because we have to, like if you don't have a small number here, if this is like one, then one can prove lower bounds in certain cases and also like we run into the parity function harness problem again. So we have to make an assumption. But on the other hand, this assumption is actually very uh, connecting to what happens in practice. So if you put everything in a classification context, then each alpha L is actually precisely the accuracy gain if you go like one layer deeper. So like alpha three will just become the accuracy gain for you like if you go like from the third layer, uh, three layer networks to four layer networks and so on. And the, let, let me not get into, into the details. There is uh, like uh, strict mathematical proof for that. Uh, and to say that we are happy to make this uh, information gap assumption. And as we will see, with this information gap assumption, then neural networks can start to learn things hierarchically. So our formal theorem is the following. That is, for every depth that is at most log log d, then for any target network g star satisfying the uh, assumptions I said, then given polynomially many samples from the, from the data set, then just using SGD, stochastic gradient descent, you can find a slightly over-parameterized uh, network G that is epsilon close to G star for any epsilon. And the sample complexity and time complexity just depends polynomially in D and one of your epsilon. So this is our formal theorem. So you may get uh, find it weird that why do we have something like log log D? So I claim first the log log D is actually pretty huge because the network we are fitting is actually of degree two to the L. Okay. So this is like super constant, like super big. And more importantly, like we should not expect going beyond the log log D because we are talking about quadratic networks, right? Even if you have well-conditioned assumptions, then the target network, the output of the target network can actually go up to something like two to the two to the L. Even if you have condition number two for each matrix, then because in the end you have degree two to the L, 
and in the end, the output can actually be two to the two to the L. And we wish to make sure that this quantity is at least like polynomial in dimension. If you have something that's exponentially large, even in the output, then you cannot expect to learn it in polynomial time, right? So we need to focus only on those functions that are at least polynomial in the output. But on the other hand, very importantly, shallow learning methods typically need dimension to the degree to learn such polynomials. And in this case, it's d to the 2 to the l, which is super polynomial. OK? And therefore, like although log log d looks small, but actually it gives a separation between neural networks and the shallow learning. And in fact, we have explicit lower bounds saying that all kernel methods and also two layer neural networks with like say uh, some two to the L degree activations, they all need this time or sample complexities. So therefore like our theorem really gives a separation between the following. That is neural networks has, can polynomially learn, uh, in polynomial time learn some function class, but all of those methods will fail. They cannot be polynomial time. Uh, but I agree that we did not rule out any shallow learning method. For instance, there are methods like tensor decomposition, sparse coding, and so on, so we did not rule them out. And also, like, there are the weak hierarchical learning methods like uh, layer-wise training and so on, so we don't have a lower bound for that. Uh, proving a lower bound for that, I think, is asking for too much. But we do have decent confidence to believe that none of those methods will be polynomial time in learning this function class I just told you. And actually, the intuition will become clear, like, in a few slides. So this is what we proved, and uh, let's see, like, really, like, what is going on. Let me use just three steps to give you intuitions about why neural networks can learn this function class, like in, say, polynomial time, but uh, other things cannot. In the first step, let us imagine a simple task of learning a degree four polynomial, that is, some degree two plus some, say, point one times degree two over degree two, which is degree four. Our hope is to say, maybe by using a two layer network, the first layer can learn x1 squared plus x2 squared up to some error, say 0.1. And then maybe the first layer will pass down x1 squared and x2 squared respectively, respectively to the second layer. Then the second layer just needs to learn a quadratic function over the output of the first layer. So this is the hope. So if so, then each layer is only learning a quadratic function over the previous layer. So this is really easy. So we don't want a single layer to learn something that's of a high degree because that's com usually computationally hard. So we want each layer to only perform simple tasks like learning quadratic functions. So this is the hope. But I claim there is an immediate bug to this. That is, why does the first layer give x1 and x2 to the second layer? Why can't the first layer give this one? So in fact, this pair also sum up to x1 squared plus x2 squared. Actually, there are infinitely many of such possibilities. And if so, then the second layer actually learning is dead on the second layer because there exists no quadratic function over this input anymore in which you can reconstruct x1 to the fourth and x2 to the fourth. And therefore, like if the first layer is passing this down to the second layer, then we cannot continue learning. So the solution to this is actually by overparameter transition. So in the actual learning network, not only we use from the theoretical perspective, also in practice, they are overparameterized. They don't just have two neurons; they have many neurons. And if so, then what the first layer is passing down to the second layer, you can actually prove that it's something like random with like some alpha i and beta i behaving like independent Gaussians. The reason for that is because you can take expectation. And this sum up just to x1 square and x2 square. And because each neuron has a different uh, Gaussian initialization, so some of them will go this way, some of them will go other ways. So therefore, like what you pass down from the first layer to the second layer is actually a rich representation of x1 square plus x2 square. And then the learning can proceed. So to sum up, in this step one, we learned that the rich representation comes from the overparameterization actually helps you to do learning of the next layer. But keep in mind that this rich representation does not help for the current layer. 
you know, from the current layer perspective, I don't care like what I learned. I learned this, I learned this, I don't care. But in fact, this re rich representation shall become later useful for later layers. Okay, so this is actually an aspect of overparameterization that uh, was not proven before. Okay, so that's our first finding. So suppose now you buy that, let's move to the next step. Suppose this time we're learning like some slightly more complicated function and our hope is the same. The first layer learns x1 square, x2 square, and let's ignore the overparameterization issue for now uh, because we already deal with it. And suppose the first layer passed down like x1 square, x2 square, and our hope is for the second layer to learn uh, basically the second term, uh, which is uh, a quadratic function over the output of the first layer and also of the input. Okay, so this is the hope. But I claim there is a second bug in this kind of reasoning. That is, why does the first layer learn x1 square plus x2 square at all? So during the training of the first layer, the first layer cannot see this quantity. What the first layer sees is actually the entire function. So from the training set, no matter how many samples you get, actually you see the entire function. Therefore, like the first layer, cannot learn this. It has to learn something that's subject to some point one error. And if so, then the first layer may be subject to some other point one error. In particular, it may overfit to this like higher level of signals. And therefore, the first layer may learn something like this, which is only alpha close to what you hope it will learn. In other words, the first layer can overfit. If so, then the learning is dead again, because the second layer, if you try to learn it uh, using a quadratic uh, activation, then like you, you cannot correct the remaining terms anymore. So this is overfitting, but this is not due to the noise of the data, but in fact, there's no noise here, right? Or the first layer is overfitting to is actually some higher level of signal. That is not noise. And if you only train the first layer, it can overfit. And this is precisely why that layer-wise training overfit to high-level signals, so it cannot go very deep. Therefore, we need to somehow fix what the first layer has learned. And this requires us to really train both layers together. So in the third step of the thinking experiment, let us consider the following scenario. So this time the first layer already learned something that's alpha close. As I said, like it overfit, so it cannot be 100% accurate. Now let's think about what the second layer can do. I claim that the second layer can in fact learn a quadratic function that is alpha square close to the target, to this part. So even though this is alpha close, right? I take this as the input, I can do a quadratic function but I claim this quantity is alpha square close to that. So this means if we train both layers together, then actually the first layer now has the hope of learning something that is alpha square close to the first quantity because we are learning both of them together to fit this function. If the second layer can be alpha square close, then the first layer can also get improved and they become alpha square close. And if so, then this output of the first layer can also be improved, becoming alpha square, and then the next layer can be alpha cube close, and this goes on. So to sum up, if you train both layers together, then actually not only like you can learn the second layer better, then you can backward correct the features of the first layer, and then you, that makes you learn the second layer even better, and so on. So in fact, things don't stop just at layer two. Like the target function you're trying to learn can have even a higher level uh, of component that's degree eight. And if you have a third layer, then something more complex like this happens, like the third layer help you to correct not only layer one, also layer two, and so on. So disclaimer, I give you this intuition by using steps, like first do this step and then do that step and so on. But in fact, in the actual training, things are learned all together. So layers are learned simultaneously. And therefore, like, those arrows here are all happening at once, okay? If you ask me, like, can I maybe distinguish this arrow from that arrow to see, like, which one improves by how much and so on, then it's kind of hard to do. The only thing I can do is to say, 
maybe let's remove the third layer and only train the first two, you see those arrows. And if you add the third layer back, you see more arrows. And I, I can tell you the difference here. So this corresponds to the experiment a few slides ago. I showed you by removing a layer, what are the features, adding it back, how do the features change? So that corresponds to that experiment. So to sum up on the first half of the talk, uh, I showed you that there are two conceptually, like two different uh, uh, procedures happening about feature learning. That is, there's forward feature learning and also backward feature correction. And also, like I give you one instance of a class of functions that can be efficiently learnable by neural networks and cannot be, and is to the best of our knowledge, is not known to be efficiently learnable by shallow learners. So that concludes the first half of the talk. Before I move to the second one of them, let me go back to this picture. That is, what are the features? Okay. So, as I said from Yuen Lacoste's lecture, then maybe those are the features. But wait a second, how do we virilize features? Okay. So when people talk about the feature virilization, they really mean one of the following two things. The first is like this experiment. That is, given an input image, I try to look at what are the neurons that get excited. Okay, I look at this neuron and what are the neurons get excited. So this is, to be precise, not really feature virilization. So feature virilization should be the following. I give you a model that's already trained. I tell you the third layer, the fourth neuron. Then I ask you, like, what does it learn? Okay. Then you're saying, oh, I don't know. Then I take an image. I tell you, uh, I tell you like, whether or not this neuron excites. So this is not exactly what this neuron is about, but it's what this neuron is with respect to a specific image. Therefore, instead, like, I want to focus on the other type of feature viralization, namely like, uh, uh, that is currently like, uh, very popularized by the Google AI team. They do the following thing, that is, Starting, instead of like taking a real image, let's start from a random image, like say, like plus random, like Gaussian noise. And then you pinpoint to a specific neuron, say maybe the fourth neuron on the third layer. And then let us try to, starting from this random image, let's try to move in a direction to excite this neuron the most, to make its signal to go as high as possible. Okay, the way to do it is by taking gradient, take backprop to find a gradient with respect to the input and then move in that direction. If you keep moving, you can find a direction or you can find an image that excites this neuron the most and this gives you a feature viralization of that neuron. Okay, so unfortunately, if you do it this way, you can't see anything like you're in the end only getting something like noise. And therefore what, for instance, those uh, Google AI teams are uh, really popularizing are those like strong regularizations you put. Namely, every iteration, like I try to move this random image in a direction uh, that excites the neuron the most, right? But unfortunately, that's like a random noise. So if I move, keep moving, it's still like a random noise. So in order to see something better, they try to regularize the gradient to make it more like an image by like say, penalizing the high frequency Fourier coefficients of that gradient. And then if you try to move in the direction of real images, then in the end, you can see something that's good. You can see something that's uh, as beautiful as this. And uh, based on this, they say, like, say, the first layer is learning edges, second layer learning, like, textures and patterns and so on. But wait a minute. I want to pause here and ask the following question, like, is that really feature viralization? So in some sense, you're trying to see what, you want to see, right? You want to see pictures. So you put a regularization to make that more like a picture. But if you remove those regularization, then what you're going to see are actually just like noise. In other words, for instance, the first neuron of the 27th layer of wide ResNet actually is learning this junk. In other words, this image will make that neuron excite the most. Okay, so then why does this happen? So after learning, like this is a, this is a real life experiment. Like after like clean training, then this image will excite that neuron the most. But why? 
I'm learning images, right? Why in the end, like the neurons are learning something like junks? So before I even mention why, let me point out that this connects closely to a very like popular talk, uh, topic nowadays that is adversarial perturbations. So we know that even if you get a well trained, like well generalizing neural network, but there usually exists like small perturbations you can add to make that image like totally something else. Like uh, people make fun of this by saying that in deep learning, pigs can fly. So the reason for this is precisely because those neurons are not actually learning pictures. They are actually learning some like high frequency noise. And because of that, then adversarial examples exist. Okay, because this corresponds to what the neuron is learning and therefore if you perturb the input into something in this direction, it can totally destroy the output of the network. So to be a bit more precise, for instance, on the CIFAR-10 data set, even if you have something that's, say, more than 94% accuracy, say, ResNet or DenseNet or even something more complex, then pretty much for all of them, if you per there exist perturbations that are very small, like, say, 0 0.005 per pixel, so that you can destroy any picture from the data set. So not only just pigs can fly, actually everything can fly. Dogs can fly, like frogs can fly. So all of them can fly. And the way to find those noise is not by randomization. So it's not a random noise. So the way to find it is actually also easy. You just take gradient with respect to the input and move in, that direct, uh, in the direction of the gradient, like seven steps. Then you can find already a perturbation to make everything fly. Okay. So this is a, actually a big issue regarding like uh, uh, nowadays like deep learning architectures. Namely, like for nearly all of them, like they are very vulnerable. They are very vulnerable to even very small attacks. So, why is that? Okay, people don't know why is that, but people have a solution. This is something weird, like in deep learning. Like there's something you don't know, but you have a solution. But very often, like you also don't know why the solution works. Okay, so here is the solution. Uh, that's a very popular and famous method nowadays called uh, adversarial training. It's also very simple. It says instead of using the original data set to do training, so you do use the perturbed images to do training. Uh, so can someone? Yeah, thanks. So instead of using the original images, you use the perturbed images to do training. And then after this kind of training, in the end of the day, uh, you get a model that is robust. So here by robust, I mean empirical robust. That is, I give the model to you, like you spend a year, 100 GPUs, based on today's techniques, you, you cannot perturb it. But people also don't know that why, whether or not it's like truly robust, like that there exists like other attackers and so on. So to sum up, like not only we don't know what adversarial why adversarial perturbations exist after clean training. Also, we don't know how adversarial training removes those directions. So we, we just not only don't know like why it exists, we also don't know, although we have a solution, but we don't know why the solution works. So those are the two questions uh, we address uh, in the next paper, also joint work with Yuan Zhu Li. So our theorem can be conceptually stated as follows. That is, during adversarial training, what happens is that the neural network will not learn new features. Also, it will not remove old features. What it does is to actually purify a small portion of the existing learned features. So let me show you what this means by pictures. So suppose, again, we do AlexNet and focus on the first layer of the features. If we do clean training, as I told you earlier, like you see this. But now if you do adversarial training, the features actually get purified. So let me put the two pictures uh, side by side by using a GIF. So now you see that the features get purified. So what does this mean is that in the, in the original like features, you may see like say three stripes, but now you see only one stripe. And the original stripes, uh, if you look closely, are kind of colorful. And now you only have black and the white stripes. And also some of the, this color feature has both like red and blue, but now you have a complete red. So features get 
do get purified. Not only on the first layer of AlexNet, but also like deeper, for instance, in uh, say ResNet 34. So for instance, uh, if you fix the first 11 layers to be robust and make do the clean training for the rest of the layers, and this is the virilization of layer 13, but if you do robust training, then here's how features will change. So the key point is that the features will also stay close to what they used to be, but in some sense, it gets purified. So this purification actually happens at every layer. So in this experiment, it's, this shows the cascading effect of feature purification for two layers, because I'm training like layer 12 and the layer 13. And then you see that features get purified. But what if you put all of the purifications like among all the layers all together, then the cascading effect, it's dramatic. Remember like in the past, these are the feature, uh, feature virilizations. So this is the first neuron, the second neuron. So those are like 32 by 32 pictures. They're all like noise. But now after adversarial training, those are the new features that you learned per neuron. This comes from a cascading effect of the feature purification of every single layer. So I won't go into the details with you, but basically you see like, for instance, a dog, for instance, some car and trucks and so on. So basically, like all the features now become very meaningful and closely related to uh, what you actually train. Not only true, like if you use L2 attacks, you can use other attacks, other different adversarial trainings, you pretty much all get this. So this is the joint effect of feature purification across all layers. And the final outcome can be really dramatic. So before I move into the math, then I think the takeaway message here is that if tomorrow someone asks you, like, what are the features, you should stop showing him or her, like, this picture. You should say, oh, those are actually the features that the neural network has learned. So um, I'm not sure if you want to tell your customer that uh, this is actually what you learned. Maybe you're going to scare your customer away. So therefore, like, uh, you had better do adversarial training. So in this way, you can get more confident about what your net neural network is actually doing. So this is a takeaway message from the experiments. So why does this happen? Like, why don't features be, get pure at the first place? And why do they get purified later if you use adversarial training? So in order to understand that, uh, let's go to the math and make two assumptions. The first assumption is that the input distribution is actually sparse in some basis. So in other words, say uh, this is what we call the sparse coding model. That is, we assume that the input vector uh, is some matrix M times a sparse vector plus noise. And this matrix is usually referred to as the dictionary because each column of the matrix can be viewed as a dictionary word. And each input is maybe a combination of three different words, but with different ways. So the po key point here is that the, uh, the hidden signal here, the Z, is sparse and then you can have some noise. So we're happy to make this assumption because real life images are indeed sparse in some basis. For instance, you can use just uh, the basis from AlexNet to reconstruct input. You only need sparsity, say 0.4, to get a decent uh, accuracy. And therefore, like making sparse assumptions uh, on the input is actually a very reasonable assumption. So on top of that, uh, for notational simplicity, we assume that the matrix is unitary squal, meaning that the columns are orthogonal. So in fact, you can also deal with incoherent non squal matrices. Let's not get into that. Uh, and here we assume that Z, the hidden signal, is k-sparse. Actually, it's a random k-sparse vector. That is any distribution satisfying this, uh, as long as the coordinates are independent and so on. So you don't need to get into the math. The punchline is that each vector Z has a norm that is order one and it's k sparse. It's either like it's either zero or like uh, it has a large signal, but it can be very like on this interval. So for this talk, think about k being uh, say d to the point three five, so less than like square root d, but also larger than a constant. Okay. Okay. Uh, this hidden signal is k sparse. And for the noise, uh, think about it being Gaussian. So we support more different kinds of noise, but think about it being Gaussian noise. Uh, and say that 
the data set uh, is actually a task for binary classification. And there is a ground truth uh, vector W star so that the label is determined by the sign of W star times Z. So think about W star just being one, 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 okay, without loss of generality. So this is the assumption we make on the input distribution or the data set. And we want to use a two layer neural network to learn it. Okay, so our theorem can therefore be stated as follows. That is like for this data set, if you use a neural network uh, like this, then first like claim training is good. And two, like if you do L2 perturbation, uh, then claim training becomes bad, even if you have infinitely many samples. But if you do adversarial training, it becomes robust against any possible attacker in this ra uh, radius in poly time. And also like for different perturbations and there are lower bounds. So those are some technical details that I don't want to get into today. Instead, I want to show you the critical part of our paper. That is, we showed actually, we actually proved how features get purified. Okay, so the remaining are just the things that you can imagine, like, uh, you know, adversarial training works. So this is our proof. But more interestingly, like, let me show you how the features get purified. So here's the intuition. First, let's talk about linear classifiers. So does linear classifier work on this data set? I claim that it does not. Although the label, remember the true label, is actually the sign of W star times D. So it's almost like linear. And indeed, the best linear classifier you can use is to use this direction to time uh, to, to, to interproduct it with the input vector. So this linear classifier is good in the sense that the base signal is precisely what you want, but it also has some noise. Okay, sitting here. And I claim the linear classifier will fail if you have large Gaussian noise. So for instance, this base signal you can calculate it's roughly one, and the noise over there, uh, if you have large noise, then it can go up to say a thousand. So the no Gaussian noise can actually kill the signal. And therefore, like linear classifier, first of all, will fail if there is large Gaussian noise. But even if say you don't have Gaussian noise, in, in fact, our positive result holds regardless of you have Gaussian noise or not. So say that you don't have Gaussian noise, but I claim linear classifier is bad for at least another reason. That is, it fails when there is L2 perturbation. Even of a very small radius, like one over root D, so if you're perturbing this direction, you can change the output of the linear classifier by more than 10, and then like the signal is killed again. So to sum up, linear classifiers is not good because it doesn't, it's not tolerant for Gaussian noise and also like it can be like adversarially attacked by even a tiny bit of, for instance, L2 perturbations. So in contrast, let's look at neural networks. So let us consider the following neural network. I write it like this. So it's like each neuron is exactly the basis vector from the dictionary and then times an indicator function. So I, I understand that this is not precisely a neural network. So the neural network has ReLU but in fact, you can implement this like uh, using ReLU uh, very easily because ReLU is nothing but a linear function times an indicator. Uh, so let me ignore this part of the math details. So just bear with me and imagine this function being a neural network. Okay. Then I claim this neural network is robust to L2 per to even a large L2 perturbation. So here's why. Let's look at this inner product like. The, which is a dictionary word times the input. So this vector, uh, this, this inner product is either zero or at least one over root k. So the signal is either not there because like uh, this is exactly zi. So z is a sparse vector. So in most cases, like the signal is not there, but if the signal is there under our assumption, like the signal will be large, okay? So if this happens, then I claim that you cannot perturb this indicator function if you perturb by something one over root k because it's already at least one over root k and therefore like if you perturb by more than one over root k then this uh, by less than one over root k then this indicator function does not change this indicator function is therefore robust against a very large 
L2 radius. How about the linear part? So because the indicator function is robust, then the linear part is also good because this is a summation over all directions, but the indicator function will only be on for k coordinates, but not for all coordinates. And therefore, like, you only have k things being added together in contrast to, for instance, here, like you have everything added together. So therefore, like the linear part also becomes robust. And you can do the math to show that this function is just robust to like square root uh, 1 over square root k L2 perturbation. So to sum up, I just showed you that using high complexity networks, especially with ReLU activation, then you can denoise better and you can be L2 robust. But in contrast, if you use a simple like simple model, like a shallow learning, like a linear model, then you cannot be robust. Okay. So this is a good message, but it didn't solve the problem because remember, like there exist networks that are robust. Doesn't mean that neural networks will find it. And indeed, if you do clean training, you cannot find it. You have to do adversarial training. So why is it so? I only need two slides to show you why. Okay. Here's the intuition. During clean training, actually, you can prove that the neurons that you learn, like each neuron is a weight vector WI, then the neurons will actually learn singleton dictionary vectors from this matrix. In other words, up to some permutation, then the first neuron will learn the first dictionary vector, the second neuron will learn the second vector, and so on. So this will happen. And regarding who wins who, this, this depends on lottery, but up to permutation, this will happen. But on top of that, each neuron during clean training is also going to learn something that is small but dense. Okay. In other words, like each neuron that got learned will look like a pure thing plus a dense mixture. So this dense mixture has components in all directions of the dictionary words. The dense mixture is so tiny that it does not affect clean training. You can do the math that you can drop it, you can put it back, it doesn't change the output of the network for any, like, uh, say, uh, data from the training set or from even from the test set. And on top of that, even if you have Gaussian noise, like Gaussian noise cannot see this dense mixture because if you're in a product, that becomes also very small. So therefore, like, those dense mixtures are like garbage. Like, it doesn't help you for clean training. But on the other hand, the dense mixtures have a common direction in which if you're perturbing that direction by, for instance, 1 over root k, then uh, you can totally change the output of the network. So those garbage here like, do not help, claim, uh, do not help like, uh, improve the training accuracy. Then why are they there? Can we somehow like, remove them during training? So in fact, even, they're so stubborn that even if you use strong regularization or weight decay or learning rate decay and so on, so, they still remain there. Okay, so why is this happening? There's a math reason. That is, this dense mixture gets accumulated step by step by SGD. So uh, why is it so? Like you can do the math to show that it accumulates. But today, instead of showing you the math, I want to show you a picture about why this happens. So here is the picture. Remember that linear classifiers are not good, right? Uh, as long as you add, say, even Gaussian noise, then linear classifiers cannot get any good training accuracy. And therefore, if you do, if you train a neural network, then even if you do just clean training, it's not going to be linear. Okay, for, at least for our data set, you're going to move to something that is at least robust to Gaussian noise, which is what we call like good at denoising. So by denoising, like here, I mean, really mean like, for instance, the indicator functions don't change. Uh, if you add Gaussian noise, if you remove it, then it doesn't change. So therefore, during clean training, you will find something that is good at denoising, for sure. Okay? But unfortunately, during clean training, you can only find something that's good at denoising, but bad at robustness. Okay? So why does this happen? Actually, it's because SGD is a local algorithm. So as long as you are good at denoising, even if like you start from here and do clean training, 
Then I claim that locally, as long as you're good at denoising, then locally it suffices for you to move in a linear direction to make progress. Okay, to put it in another way of saying, if you are currently already good at denoising, then what does SGD do is it adds some 0.001 weight times the gradient to the current network. And this gradient will just become a, a, will just, uh, become a linear function, which is a linear dense uh, predictor. And because you're already good at denoising, then this incremental thing suffices to be some dense linear prediction. And th that will be sufficiently good for this local movement. And because SGD is a local algorithm, then it starts to accumulate this dense mixtures. Although it doesn't need it, but in every single step, like it will start to be added. So in the end, uh, dense mixtures exist, and you have to use like really adversarial training to tell you that, to tell the algorithm that, oh, so far I have already accumulated enough dense mixtures. I should stop doing that. And that's why adversarial training can help you like go back to actually get something that is pure and robust. So therefore to sum up, uh, this is the second half of the talk. I showed you that during claim training, like you may, you may accumulate some dense mixtures and after adversar adversarial training, uh, you can get back something that is more pure and more accurate. So uh, if you put the two halves of the talk together, then today actually I showed you three things about feature learning. That is, we not only have forward feature learning, but also backward feature correction. And if on top of that you do adversarial training, then you can have feature purification. So this is a gift of like putting everything together. So I hope uh, by this talk, you can now understand a bit better about how features evolve uh, during training and what the features really are. So regarding what we can do next. So once we understand better of the features, I can imagine like a million of things to do next. For instance, like uh, one of the mysteries about deep learning is that ensemble works. So you can train maybe uh, one set of features, you can train another set of features, but once you put the models together, you can get an even better model. So this is something that's totally false in the traditional convex world, because for a convex problem, you can train it a thousand times, you're going to get the same solution. But why for deep learning, uh, suddenly like uh, you can train the network like multiple times uh, and somehow get improved accuracy. And actually in a follow-up of ours, we are exactly working on that. That is not only you can have one pass of this, you can have another pass of that, then the features, uh, uh, then like once you do ensembles, then you can, start to learn something more like just by combining the features of different network, uh, different learning proced procedures and so on. So uh, therefore I hope that uh, you can now have a better understanding about what the features are. Uh, thank you, that concludes the talk. Thanks. Happy to take questions and also offline. And by the way, like if you are motivated by this talk and find applications about those visualizations, like feel free to uh, reach out to me even offline and so on. So I'm happy to take questions now. Thanks everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if people, can you, uh, if you have questions, please use the hand raising feature in Teams. Um, and I can call on.